Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. The Apostle Paul lived a very exciting life, to say the least. We left him in our last lesson being rescued for a second time by Roman soldiers while being in Jerusalem, and this happened within a couple of days of each other. The first time took place while Paul was nearing the end of a week-long vow that he had taken to seek the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem, and he did this with a few other brothers. Some men, possibly from Ephesus, which was a Roman province in Asia, recognized Paul from his ministering the gospel in that part of the world. Their animosity against him was so great that they started a riot in an effort to have him killed. The Roman soldiers arrived just in the nick of time before the mob was able to accomplish their dastardly deed. The second time he was rescued by Roman soldiers, we studied in our last lesson. In this account, the soldiers rescued Paul from the Pharisees and Sadducees, who were having a violent debate over whether or not people are resurrected after death. Because the Sanhedrin council failed to solve the problem of Paul while meeting with the Roman tribune, some zealots decided to take things into their own hands and conspired to murder Paul by laying a trap for him. Paul's nephew somehow learned about this plot, where over 40 men devised a plan to kill Paul through an ambush. This is where we left off in our last lesson. So let's pick up with Paul's nephew talking to the tribune. Let's begin with verses 19 through 21 of Acts chapter 23. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me, he said. The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The young man laid out to the tribune the plot to murder Paul by an ambush, and from the response of Lysias, he knew the young man was speaking the truth. We aren't told how the tribune knew the lad was telling the truth. It may have been that the request from the Sanhedrin had already been presented to him, or that messengers from the council were waiting to talk to him right at that moment. No matter how the tribune came to see the truth of the matter, his response was decisive and serious. In verse 22, the commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. There are two primary reasons why the tribune gave Paul's nephew this warning not to tell anyone that he had met with Roman officials. If news of the tribune's plans reached the men who were part of the plot to kill Paul, they might change their plans and follow the Roman guards looking for an opportunity to attack them, and so kill Paul that way. The second reason was to keep the young man's life safe from any repercussions by someone finding out that he informed the tribune of their secret plan. After dismissing the young man, we are told in verses 23 and 24, Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. The tribune is a commander of a thousand men, so he sent roughly half his men under his command to protect Paul from an ambush of over 40 zealots. Centurions are normally in command of a hundred men, but in this instance it appears that the two centurions shared the command of almost 500 men. From a Roman standpoint, this would be a great privilege. There were 470 soldiers that left Jerusalem for Caesarea, but as we will soon see, they did not all go to Caesarea. The distance between the two cities is roughly 57 miles as the bird flies, but they couldn't fly, so it was over 70 miles using the old Roman roads. The plan the tribune gave the two centurions was to stop about a third of the way to Caesarea at Antipratus, and they were to leave at 9 p.m. and travel through the night. This would be a long, hard trek, especially at night. Since a detachment of soldiers included 400 men on foot, they would only be able to walk 20 to 30 miles in a day, so it's possible that they covered this distance while traveling through the night. The 70 men on horseback would have to keep pace with the foot soldiers and do the scouting. 
With this large of a detachment, my guess is that they needed to take food and water. There would need to be enough horses and donkeys laden with food and water to feed that number. They probably needed a few cooks as well, so the detachment could have been around 500 men. Then there would also be the return trip to the Tribune in Jerusalem, because those men were under his command. Some commentators think that there were only 200 soldiers on foot, and they were all spearmen, plus the 70 cavalry. They make this claim because there were only two centurions to command this detail, and since that rank of soldier only leads 100 men, there could have only been 200 men under their charge, not 400. I don't think this is good reasoning, since there were also 70 men that made up the cavalry, and it seems that the two centurions were the ones in charge of the entire mission. At the very least, the centurions were commanding 270 men, or how I read it, that there were actually 470 soldiers with three distinct different ranks of soldiers. Either way, when you add up the numbers, this is a very large expensive endeavor to transport just one prisoner to Governor Felix, who was in Caesarea. This happened because Paul was a Roman citizen. If he hadn't been a Roman citizen, he probably wouldn't have had such a bodyguard or even been sent to Felix in the first place. The large contingent of soldiers was to get Paul safely to Caesarea and to discourage an attack from the 40-plus men who had vowed to kill Paul. Tribune Lysias didn't want any casualties or a catalyst to start a larger conflict. Some commentators speculate that Dr. Luke went with Paul because the Tribune gave Paul mounts, which is plural. Yet we don't see the doctor writing in the first person, so I don't think that this is the case. In verse 25, we are told that the Tribune wrote a letter to explain his actions, which goes from verse 26 through verse 30. The letter formally opens in verse 26, Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency, Governor Felix, greetings. History describes Felix as a monster of cruelty, avarice, and licentiousness. In verse 27, Lysias embellishes the account a little bit, writing, This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he was a Roman citizen. We know from the actual account that the Tribune hadn't learned about Paul's Roman citizenship until after he was brought into the barracks and was about to be flogged. But given the nature of writing back then, we can understand why he abbreviated the story. Lysias went on to write in verses 28 and 29, I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. Verse 28 makes it sound like the tribune brought Paul to the chambers of the Sanhedrin, but as we looked at earlier, he was brought down to where the Sanhedrin was meeting in the fortress of Antonia. In this sense, it could be said that Paul was brought to the Sanhedrin, who were waiting for him in a meeting room of the fortress. Dr. Luke is such an excellent historian, he made sure this letter was integrated into the story, and we see from this his integrity. It's obvious that the Roman tribune didn't understand the dynamics of the Jewish religion and the divisions that exist between the various denominations. All he could say is that the dispute was over questions about their religious laws, which was true. Lysias declared that there wasn't any accusations that could invoke imprisonment much less a death penalty. The Tribune continued his letter in verse 30. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. It's a true statement that immediately after learning about the plot against Paul that the Tribune sent Paul to Felix, who had greater authority to judge the matter. It may also be that the Tribune wanted the whole messy issue removed from Jerusalem so as to avoid another riot. We find in this verse some more information on what happened. After sending Paul away at 9 p.m., the Tribune sent to the Sanhedrin a message on the next day. This would have easily put Paul out of the reach of those who had plotted to kill him. Lysias also commanded Paul's accusers to bring their charges to Felix. In the next verse we are told, So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipratus. This was a fortress built by Herod the Great, who named it after Antipas, his father. It would have been a safe haven for Paul and the soldiers, 
By the time the cavalry continued on to Caesarea, there would have been no hope of fulfilling the vow to kill Paul that the over 40 men had made. The reason why they stopped at this fortress is stated in verse 32. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. If my guess is correct, the detachment of soldiers arrived sometime probably between 9 a.m. and noon, before the heat of the day made travel difficult. All the soldiers had the remainder of that day to rest, and then in the morning the foot soldiers headed back to Jerusalem, while the cavalry took Paul on horseback to Caesarea. The cavalry would be able to outdistance any of the men who were trying to kill Paul. Besides, 70 men on horseback was a mighty force in that day that 40 men on foot wouldn't want to mess with. They probably reached Caesarea before nightfall. Verses 33 through 35 tell us what happens next. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Governor Felix wanted to know what Roman province Paul was from to see if he had authority to judge the case. Where a Roman citizen is born is considered the province to which he belongs, even if he is living in another province. Felix declared that he would hear the case, which seems to indicate that Cilicia was under his jurisdiction. He still kept Paul under guard because he was considered guilty until proven innocent. Though the palace Paul was taken to was built by Herod the Great, it was used by the Roman governor, and it was within that fortress palace that there was some kind of guardhouse that was used to house Roman prisoners. Turning to Acts chapter 24, we read in verse 1, Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. We aren't told how the high priest traveled to Caesarea, but I doubt it was on foot. There are actually four other options, horse, donkey, mule, or camel. If he traveled by horse, he probably did anywhere from 30 to 70 miles a day. It's a good possibility that he took two days to travel to Caesarea, if they had very good horses and they were excellent riders, they could possibly have done it in one, but that's probably not the case. I didn't take the time to see how far a donkey or mule can travel in a day, but my thoughts would be that it would be probably a three-day journey. I doubt if they use camels. Arriving in Caesarea, they would have stayed at the home of a prominent Jew, possibly one who sat on the council or was among the chief priests. After arriving and making himself presentable, the high priest and his entourage would make a formal visit to Governor Felix. Ananias took with him some of the elders who sat on the Sanhedrin council, along with a lawyer who was either an expert in the law of Moses or in Roman law, and his name was Tertullus. The high priest wanted to present a formal charge against Paul that at least outwardly appeared to be serious so he brought a lawyer with him to make it all appear as if Paul committed a serious offense. A formal complaint hadn't yet been issued, so it seems like it was lodged at this time. Who Tertullus was, we don't know. There's the possibility that he was a Roman Gentile due to his Roman name. But a Roman name doesn't mean that it's an absolute that he wasn't Jewish or of Jewish descent. If he had a Gentile father and a Jewish mother, he was then considered Jewish. Then you have, in verse 2, the attorney making a we statement, and this makes it feel like he was one of the Jews, not merely a Gentile attorney for hire. I have a hard time imagining that the high priest would travel with a Gentile, given their strict laws of separation. But when people are desperate, they will do things that they otherwise wouldn't. But the high priest was a high-profile position that would have been closely watched, especially by his enemies, so he wouldn't do anything that would defile him or make him unclean. If the Sanhedrin hired an expert in Roman law, then he would have been able to present a strong case that would possibly convict Paul, that is, if they had any real evidence. It seems that Tertullus wasn't a lawyer after the Jewish fashion who were experts in the Mosaic law, and this is why a lot of commentators think that he was a Gentile. Yet it only stands the reason that Jews who were raised in the Roman Empire outside of Israel would be knowledgeable in Roman law and possibly even educated in it. A similar thought has been made about doctors in Israel, that they were all Gentiles. But that doesn't make any sense at all, because there were certainly Jewish doctors.
The King James Version calls Tertullus an orator, but the word attorney is probably a better fit. The man was trained at presenting legal arguments, either as a defense or prosecuting attorney. Since the Jews weren't knowledgeable of Roman law, under such circumstances they would hire an attorney who knew the minute details of civil law. As we look at what the attorney said in his opening arguments, we see that he was a master of flattery, as verses 2-4 through four reveals. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. Felix would have taken notice that the charges laid against Paul were done by the high priest through his attorney. This would give the impression that there was a serious case that needed a serious response. There are three parts of the argument Tertullius presents, the first being his opening statement that's oozing with flattery. The second is his proposition that contains the reason for the charges, and this is seen in verses 5 and 6. The third is his conclusion that states why Felix should try this case and find Paul guilty, and this is seen in verses 7 and 8. Tertullus flattered Felix for only one reason, and that was to sway the governor to side with them. The flattery is nothing but lies since Felix was a brutal, debauched ruler. He was originally a slave who was set free by Claudius Caesar, from whom he received the name Claudius. Being a friend of the emperor, he was elevated to positions of power and became the governor over Judea and Syria. His rule is a reflection of his being a slave that was elevated to a position of power, for he was heartless, egotistical, and a sensual man that went through many wives. He was recalled to Rome over his abuses and incompetencies, was brought to trial, found guilty, and barely escaped death through the intercession of his brother, who was also a royal favorite. One expression of Felix's corruption is seen in how he would have let Paul go free if the apostle had given him a bribe. When Felix was called back to Rome, he left Paul in prison to appease the Jews in hope that it would help him with his trial in Rome. To tell his proposition is laid out in verses 5 and 6. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. Was there more to the attorney's proposition than what's written here? Well, we don't know, but I would think so. But all his accusations aren't backed up with any proof. The account doesn't say that any eyewitnesses were there to give substance to the alleged crimes. They accused Paul of starting riots, which he never did. And the attorney lied that Paul was the ringleader or head of the Nazarene sect, which was meant to be a derogatory title. Paul wasn't the head of the church, neither was Peter or James, though James does appear to be the overseer of the church in Jerusalem. Tertullus was bringing accusations against Paul without witnesses or evidence. The attorney stated that Paul tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. Yet there were no eyewitnesses to this act, since it never happened. This is a lie that was advanced by those who started the riot out of hatred for Paul, but ultimately out of hatred for Jesus. This last point that Tertullus made, which I just mentioned, makes it sound like the attorney was Jewish and was even in the temple when it happened. Up until this last point, the strategy of the attorney was to make all the accusations be civil in nature and not religious. But he couldn't resist not mentioning the last point that was religious in nature. If he was a Gentile, then he probably wouldn't have mentioned this because it wouldn't have helped sway Felix to judge in their favor. The moment the accusations became religious, then Felix wouldn't waste his time arguing over religious matters. I think the point on desecrating the temple only shores up the idea that Tertullus was Jewish, for this would be the kind of response someone would give who was personally involved. The conclusion to his formal argument is seen in verses 7 and 8. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us, and with great violence took him away out of our hands. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him.
The end of verse 6 and all of 7 and the beginning of verse 8 is left out of many modern translations because that portion of Acts is questioned as to its authenticity. Many major, important, ancient manuscripts don't contain it. I will teach it as if it was original, just to go over the material, since some of you read from the King James Version or the New King James Version or from some other translation that includes it. Whether this portion of Acts is included or excluded doesn't change the account or alter the truth of Scripture. Let me read verses 6-8 through eight out of the New King James Version. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by with great violence, took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. The first point is that the New King James Version states that the Sanhedrin wanted to try Paul according to their law, which would have been contrary to the Mosaic law. But this is a lie since everything they were doing was 100% contrary to the law. They didn't want to try Paul according to the law. They wanted to kill him right then and there. They didn't want a trial according to the law, for that would expose them as liars and hypocrites. Next, they were in the process of murdering Paul when Lysias rescued him. Then you have the fact that it was the Jews who started the riot, not Paul. They were the ones who were being violent, and this is why Lysias entered the temple grounds. The tribune, whom Tetelus was bad-mouthing, performed his duty in the way that he did because the mob was so violent, and this is something the attorney conveniently left out. Half-truths and twisted accounts are lies no matter how they are worded, and this is to break the ninth commandment, which is about not bearing false witness against people. They were not only giving false testimony against Paul, but also against Lysias. Like so many politicians, they thought lying was acceptable so long as it produced the end results that they wanted. They believe the lie that the end justifies the means, but this is contrary to the righteousness the Lord requires His people to live out in every situation, including a court of law. What the attorney said reveals he was filled with anger and resentment and hate as he made it. He may have said all this with a smile, but he spoke it with a hypocrite's expression of humility and politeness. Tertullus closed his arguments by stating that if Felix properly examined Paul, that he would learn the truth about him and arrive at the same conclusion. This is raw arrogance and sheer manipulation. This isn't anything new, for attorneys and politicians of all ages and cultures do the same thing. All the evidence is actually against the high priest and his cronies, that they are guilty before a holy God of committing evil in the name of God. In verse 9, we see the response of the high priest and his minions. The Jews joined in the accusation, asserting these things were true. Each of those men were guilty before God of bearing false witness before the governor against Paul. They were liars, wearing fancy, expensive religious clothes, and this makes their crime all the worse and their judgment all the most sure and severe. When they should have been living testimonies of the one true God, all they did was blaspheme him before Jews and Gentiles. We now come to Paul's defense that's found in verses 10 through 21. Let's begin with verse 10. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have judged over this nation, so I am glad to make my defense. The first thing we see is that Paul's defense doesn't contain any flattery. He states the truth that Felix has been a judge over Israel, which at this time was six or seven years. Paul used the idea of judge in this statement like the Old Testament does when referring to those who are judges that ruled the nation. Judges in the Old Testament were appointed by God, and the calling didn't belong to one tribe or family clan, but was according to God's will and calling. Felix wasn't a king, but he was a governor of the land appointed by Rome, yet Paul used the Jewish term and called him a judge. Why did Paul say that he gladly made his defense before Felix? Because the prophetic words given by various people about Paul was starting to be fulfilled. He was beginning to testify before rulers. Then in verse 11, Paul said, You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Paul not only didn't use flattery to sway the judge, 
He was not using lies either. In the argument of Tertullus, there were no facts offered, but Paul is going to lay out verifiable facts and ones that could easily be substantiated. Paul had only arrived in Jerusalem 12 days earlier, so the evidence was fresh. The apostle went on to state in verse 12, My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple, or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue, or anywhere else in the city. This is a fact that Paul is stating, not an opinion. Paul was in the temple seeking God, not preaching or arguing with people. He did nothing to stir up the crowd, whether in synagogues, Jerusalem, or even in the temple. He was seeking God, and his antagonizers were the ones who started the disturbance. Then Paul presented a powerful fact in verse 13, And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. The high priests, the elders of the Sanhedrin Council, and Tertullus didn't bring any evidence to back up their outrageous charges that they were bringing against Paul. But Paul had evidence that he was innocent of any crime. If Felix would have been a just man, then he would have dismissed the case then and there because there wasn't any evidence of a crime. But he was an unjust, vile, and greedy ruler. Paul went on to say it in verses 14 and 15, However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Paul was boldly proclaiming that he was a follower of Messiah, and this is what every believer should be doing. He was also testifying that he was upholding the Mosaic law in all the Old Testament scriptures that teach that there is a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. The high priest was a Sadducee, and it's probable that some of his elders that were there were as well. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, and this is central to why they totally reject the resurrection of Christ. There may have been a couple of Pharisees among them, but that wouldn't change the outcome of anything. The implication that there's a resurrection of the dead means that there will be a day of reckoning when people will give an account before God, and such a thought terrified the Sadducees. Paul then made the bold profession in verse 16, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. The apostle declared that he had a clear conscience. Why? Because he walked upright before God and man. That's how he lived on a constant basis. This is an extremely important issue. Every follower of Jesus should live in such a way that we have a clear conscience before God and people. This presents two ideas. First, we must keep ourselves from actively practicing sin, and second, we must be actively seeking to please God in all things. If we are living to please God, then the first point of not practicing sin will flow out of the second point of seeking to please the Lord in everything. If we are only striving to live a moral life, we are then in rebellion against God because the motive of the life isn't about pleasing the Lord, but about being a supposed good person. The Bible clearly states that there is no such thing as a good person, which means that the person who claims to be good is actually evil according to God and his word. Such people are no different than the religious elite that murdered the Savior and was now attacking Paul in an effort to have him murdered. If we want a life that's acceptable and pleasing to God, then we need to be a people that make it the goal of our life to please the Savior in everything, for it's impossible to live such a life by time and chance. Foundational to developing a life that's pleasing to God is living out the first and greatest commandment, which is to love God supremely. Until we are pursuing God out of a passionate love for Him, we will merely be pretending to be good people. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill, let healing waters bear away.
Yeah.